Well, uh, thank you for uh, attending. It's a tough uh, talk to follow with Christoph. Um, a lot of people don't really appreciate third world country diseases and problems, and it's something that we need to really think about. I'm going to talk to you about something very different today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some work I've been doing for 25 years on developing vaccines against addiction. A little bit about us. We're the Scripps Research Institute. We're on the other side of the pond. We're at the Pacific Coast side. We were founded in 1961. We're one of the largest uh, biomedical institutes in the country. Um, and I like to say, they ask what kind of research we do. We do everything from A to Z. So everything from Alzheimer's to Zika, you can find people doing work at Scripps on this. Um, in today's lecture, what I thought I'd frame to you is discuss the big problem of opioid abuse. Um, if you've been in a vacuum, you probably haven't heard about it, but I think everyone's heard about the problem with opioid abuse and it's become an epidemic level. Uh, so how has it gotten to this point? Well, part of the problem is that pharmaceutical companies are making tonnage amounts of these drugs and physicians are, selling, are basically prescribing these at increased rates. What types of opioids am I talking about? Well, people have probably heard about heroin, hydrocodone, oxycodone. Maybe you haven't heard about things like fentanyl. Fentanyl has is, is been around for over 60 years, but it's now starting to reinfiltrate our country. There's things as China White, acetyl fentanyl. These types of drugs are 50 to 100 times more potent than these other types of drugs, and people are taking these with the thought that there's something else, and we've seen overdose and death. There's approximately 30 million people are addicted to opioids today, 30 million, most of them in the U.S. So if you think about the number of people addicted, the costs of criminal justice system, uh, lost lives, it goes into billions of dollars. So one of the questions is, why aren't we coming up with, with new ways to treat this, new research? We just saw recently, I think the Obama uh, released about a billion dollars for opioid treatment. None of this is going for research, absolutely nothing. So one of the questions is, why isn't this going for research? Well, if I pull someone off from the audience that maybe had Alzheimer's disease, or if I brought someone else out that was a heroin addict, you look at these two people in a very different context, all right? The problem that really exists today is most people don't view addicts as a brain disease, right? They view it as a moral failure on the part of the individual, a willful act. And so if you look at it that way, it's very difficult to fund that, right? It's a brain disease, just like any other disease. And so if we could bring this into context that we think of it this way, maybe we'll start getting some more dollars in this. The other big problem in trying to fund this research is the, is the, is the basic tenet is that pharmaceutical companies don't look at drug acts as a good investment. It's as simple as that. They're looking for a return, and they're not going to get it. So they're not going to invest in that. And so those are some of the problems I've had to come up with. I've been working on this for over 25 years. I used to have hair, actually a lot of hair back then. Uh, so if I keep, I gotta get, we get some money uh, moving forward, otherwise I'm gonna have even less hair. Okay, so I want you to come away with the idea of why not develop a vaccine, all right? So there are methods for treatment out there. There's uh, obviously buprenorphine, there's methadone. These are substitution type, placements, but it's really treating a drug with another drug. And so a number of years ago, I was looking at these types of therapeutics. I thought, this is kind of ridiculous. Why am I going to do this? There's things like naltrexone, long-term acting. But there's problems with this because when you become resensitized, and if you do heroin again, it's easy to overdose. So I started to look outside the box. You know, if you, if you kind of continue to keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different result, this is kind of what I would consider insanity. You have to start thinking of different ways to treat these things. And so at the end of this lecture, hopefully you'll think, why not a vaccine? So vaccination has been around since antiquity. The Chinese used to use an, uh, vaccination for um, variolation. So what they do is take dried pustules and grind them up and actually snort these. Just think about now, we have flu vaccines, which are internasal. This was done back in the year 1000. Uh, Edward Jenner, we don't have his picture, was the father of modern immunology. I'm sure you, all you people have heard before the milk cow analogy where 
Um, these women who uh, were associated with milking cows, they didn't develop uh, smallpox because they got transmitted cowpox. So he took dried pustules, injected this young boy who lived. That was the, basically the founding of so-called vaccinology. Um, Pasteur discovered what's now modern-day vaccines with regards to killed type uh, bacteria. And then uh, in 1900, the US Army in yellow fever. It's interesting because those mosquitoes that transmitted yellow fever back then are the same mosquitoes now that transmit Zika. Okay, the other thing is that vaccines have saved more lives than any other therapeutic known, and I can easily argue that. Um, one thing to take note is that the original polio vaccine wasn't funded by the government. It was funded through the March of Dimes. So what happened was people like Eddie Cantor said, send your dimes to President Roosevelt. And millions of dimes came in. And that actually went in and funded the Salk polio vaccine. There's another individual, if you can hardly see him, but his name was Hillman. And probably no one's ever heard of this guy. He's developed about 12 to 14 vaccines, such things as rubella, measles, and mumps. Never won any awards save millions of lives. Most people just don't identify vaccines as being a good therapeutic, but it is. So I try to make this as simple as possible. How do we make these vaccines? So drugs of abuse do not induce an immune response. So if you get a virus or a bacterial infection, we will mount an immune response, but drugs won't. So if you're taking heroin or cocaine, you're not going to get an immune response. So what I've done over the last 25 years is trick the immune system to recognize the drug as being foreign. And so what I do is I make a mirror image of that drug. We then add some ingredients that allow for T cell and B cells to be stimulated. And then antibodies are produced against that drug. So what happens is that when the individual takes the drug, the antibodies block that drug from crossing over the blood brain barrier and reaching the pleasure centers or the parts for involved in addiction in the brain. So a, a firewall, if you have it, stops the drug from reaching the brain. And that's it in a nutshell. It's a very simple approach. OK, I think, oh no, OK. Oh, these all came up at once. All right, so what vaccines do we work on? We work on such things as nicotine, obesity, cocaine, uh, opioids such as heroin, synthetic opioids, fentanyl, uh, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and methamphetamine. So there'll be an exam a little later. So you have to be able to pick out which is the meth lab. Hopefully you can figure that one out. OK, so to preference this, what I'm going to show you is I can't trust someone out who has a heroin addiction problem. What I'm going to show you is some mice where we vaccinated one mouse and another mouse we didn't vaccinate. None of the mice are going to get hurt. Hopefully it'll play. Um, what we're going to do is give one mouse two migs per kg of heroin. So you could put that, a mouse weighs about 30 grams, so it's a fairly good dose. About four migs per kg will kill the mouse, right? In the vaccinated animal, we're going to give them 18 migs per kg of heroin. That's a huge amount for an overdose. And so we've gone as high as 40 migs per kg. So hopefully you'll see the difference. We're going to play it now between the two. One that's not vaccinated, the other one that's vaccinated. So you can see the little guy that has the 18 migs per kg lethal dose is vaccinated. He's happy as a little clam running around. In fact, see right here, he wants to get out of the box. He's had enough. OK. So imagine if we could put this in a human, what we could do. So I kind of just want to finish up with a couple of points why I think these vaccines are of high value. First of all, vaccines are very inexpensive to manufacture. That's why they're typically used in a lot of third world countries. So from that standpoint, there shouldn't be a problem in distributing. The second thing is that the vaccine could stand alone, but it can be used with cognitive behavioral therapy. And in fact, it could be used with such things as methadone or even ibuprofen type treatments. The final thing, well, the, uh, the pre-final is that I believe vac these vaccines meet an unmet medical need a different way to look at how to treat addiction. And finally, 
I didn't talk about all the data. We have plenty of it. I think the data is very positive. I just showed you the one little video that I have strong confidence that these vaccines, if placed in the right context, will have an effect on trying to get people off addiction. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. We do have time for a few brief questions. Um, hi, my name's ooh, Haley. I'm actually uh, here at the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism. So if you have time later, I'd love to talk to you some more. But um, I'm wondering if your target, I guess, um, not audience exactly, but these vaccines would be used for people who are currently in recovery or are going into rehab? Right, yeah. So um, we view these, I don't, I don't, you know, someone asked the question, I don't view these vaccines as we're going to vaccinate children with them. That's, you know, so who are we going to va vaccinate? Kids from La Jolla or kids from the inner city? That's probably not going to happen. So what I really view the importance of these vaccines are people are undergoing abstinence. So if you've ever known anyone who has a drug problem, they relapse many times, right? It's a real, it's a, it's a problem. And so um, typically what happens when someone relapses, they could hear a particular song, maybe smell something, be talking to some people, and they're going to go off and do the drug. And what happens to that happens, they spiral down to ground zero. They've got to start all over again. And so what I think these vaccines would be most useful for is if the person's vaccinated, they may take the drug, they're not going to spiral down to ground zero again, they can think, you know what, I shouldn't be probably doing that. The other thing that I think could be of value is that a lot of times, especially with opioids, when people stop taking them, they become uh, sensitized, and if they go back and try to take the drug again, it's very easy for them to overdose. And so I think that the vaccines in place, less chance for overdose. I'm Tamara Kane Doniger. Um, I'm wondering what kind of timeline we'd be looking at if this ended up being successful and going to clinical trials um, before it could actually be used. So um, that's a great question, and that's really incumbent on uh, the amount of dollars. I've been kind of working uh, off and on for over 25 years in this. Sometimes I have money to work on this, sometimes I don't have money to work on this. The only vaccines that have really been funded is ones on nicotine. Why? because HMOs pay for people who smoke. It's really tough to convince someone to pay for someone who's a crack addict. You know, I don't know many CEOs that are crack addicts. I don't know many people or tweakers, right? And so that's the real issue is getting money in to develop these things. I've done a lot of the groundwork. I'm, in terms of the uh, heroin vaccine we have, I'm convinced that'll work. It's pretty much just grinding it out and moving it forward. But, to probably get this through phase three clinical trials will cost 30 or 40 million dollars. And that's a tough thing to get someone to put forward. My question is connected with that. Um, it is very hard to get pharmaceutical companies to support research of this kind. And you've also indicated it is perhaps not very popular with the public. So given the potential you've described, what are the best funding strategies? I mean, is this something that uh, you could imagine some contribution from crowdfunding or some of the things that we've heard about? Because otherwise, it's just going to get stuck. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And, and um, I always am confronted with this. I've kind of gotten to a point in my career, I'm not looking to make any money on this. There's two things I'm doing. I'm, I'm, before I retire, I want to make sure that things happen. I want to get this vaccine forward and I work in river blindness, and I'm not looking to make any money. There's not, people may think they're going to make money. I'm not looking to do that. Um, I'm really looking for funding that we can move it along slowly. The, most of the money I've had has come from National Institute of Drug Abuse, and they can only give so much for this. Furthermore, it's kind of limited by panels who, who have to view my research as being important. If they don't think it's important, I can't get the money. Um, I really think it's going to take... Uh, someone from philanthropic to step forward to give us some money. I've identified uh, a biotech company that's going to help me with the heroin vaccine. The only reason that's happening is because it's a friend of mine and he knows it's important to me. And so we're doing this on the side. Um, he's got experience in moving things through phase clinical trials, but we kind of inch it along. We get a little bit of money, 
then we don't have money, then we get to get a little bit more money, so we kind of stop and start, stop and start. It's not like I have, if it was a pharmaceutical company, I could put 50 people on it and move it along. It's a pretty straightforward shot how to do this. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. I've taken care of that to this point. It's, it's, it's pretty much know-how, and so if someone stepped up to the plate with some money, it could be moved forward very quickly. And, and, and getting back to your question, I have tons of emails from addicts or parents that contact me saying, how can we get this forward? How can we move it forward? Most of these people don't have the money. They'll, they say, well, we can give you $10 or $20, some, something like that. You know, it's heartbreaking to hear some of the stories of the kids that are addicts and their families or how they're affected. Um, and, you know, the, the problem is I know that I have something that can help them. And I just can't go out and vaccinate people because if I do that, I'm going to go to jail. Okay, so I have to move through regulatory uh, constraints. We just have one last question. Okay. Hi, you mentioned a vaccine for obesity. Can you talk a bit more about that? <clears throat> yeah, okay. Well, uh, that's something I that developed some years ago. It's a, a hormone called ghrelin. It's thought to be involved with feeding behavior. And uh, we came up with this vaccine about eight or 10 years ago. And uh, it was viewed um, with skeptics on both sides, skeptics and naysayers, because people are saying you can't uh, vaccinate against endogenous hormone. Uh, so what it does is it basically uh, uh, blocks this hormone from reaching the pleasure centers of the brain, and it seems to stop. Uh, it doesn't stop eating. It actually uh, lowers the amount of fat content and changes the metabolic rate. So the animals actually ate the same, but they lost weight. But then people were thinking, well, we could just go to McDonald's and gorge ourselves. That's not true. But, it, but it, that that's, was the overall plan there. Thank you so much, Dr. Danda.